I love my church. You guys know that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and uh, this is the name of the series that we're in right now. And uh, this morning we're talking about keeping the faith. Uh, we're going to talk about, uh, I wouldn't say it's uncomfortable, but we're going to talk about an idea that not many people really enjoy. And it's the word accountability. And accountability is really an idea that um, you find those friends in faith, people that um, are, uh, uh, you know, a, a match for you, like a buddy that can um, hold you up, who can talk to you about where you're at, who can um, tell you the truth when you are um, making some not so good choices. Uh, I don't know if you guys have friends like that, but the church is a great place to find friends like that. Um, you know, the, 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 uh, the pastor shouldn't be the only one to um, tell you you're being naughty. Um, your friends should tell you too. You know, your, your friends should be there for you too. Your friends should be there to encourage you, to um, tell you, look, this is not a good choice. And if you continue on this road that you're on right now, um, you're going to make a really, really bad decision. You just might blow up your life. Um, John 13, 34, and 35, uh, Jesus said this, a new command I give you, to love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. You see, the early church was a special place. We talked about last week, we talked about giving. We talked about how the early church shared their possessions and there was some honesty going on last week, as I told you guys last week. Um, we could use an increase. Yes, I am saying give more, as you have opportunity to, okay? But last week we talked about how this amazing group of people that gather together were able to encourage one another, were, were able to um, stand strong with one another, were able to... Uh, speak to one another truthfully, boldly, honestly. Um, you know, at times the weight of the world feels really heavy. And we make poor choices. I mean, we, we, we're Christians, all right? We're Christians. And everybody's like, well, um, they, they think, well, you just think you're perfect. And I've found many times that, um, you know, when I tell people, no, actually, I'm one of the most wretched of them, <laughs> uh, you know, those sinners, those bad people, I don't, I'm not perfect, you know, um, you know, you're looking at me like, yeah, sure, Pat. just ask my wife, <laughs> no, don't, um, <laughs> please don't, <laughs> um, but his spirit is transformational, there's, there's some wonderful things going on in this church and some incredible things that are happening within the very hearts of the people in this church. I know it may not be noticeable on the outside. I know that it may not be recognizable like, like we say, yeah, God is moving and God is doing some awesome things, but we may not recognize it. I recognize it. Like you can see hearts that are truly changing. Revolution is happening. Like we get our minds set on revolution. Like, okay, if, if God was moving in huge ways, the building would be packed and there would be tons of, of, of no seating left. But I'm telling you right now that the conversations that I've had with personal individuals is telling me clearly that change is happening. People's hearts are being affected by the truth. His spirit that dwells in us is affecting us. And here's the thing. In this revolution that happens, it happens best right here with the family. We are family. I've always called you that. 
I've always held on to that. Whenever I meet you in public, I don't dodge you in aisle ways. If you see me walking in the opposite direction, you think I've dodged you, you, you misunderstood because I don't dodge people, even when I know it's going to be uncomfortable. Because you know that you've been in stores before and you're like, oh snap, <laughs> I'm out. <laughs> but we're family. And our actions say something about who we are. I mean, Here's, here's, uh, I'm going to give you three quick points. Point number one, we all battle with drift. You, you ever put a boat in water and, and just watch the boat without any anchor, without anything sealing it to its place, without anything holding it in its place, it drifts. It moves by natural current or whatever the case may be. There's something in in the water that causes that drift to happen. And we all drift. We all make poor choices. Every one of us in this building has done something <laughs> that they regret. Some of us, honestly, <laughs> like, really, just this week, this last week, we're like, oh, why did I do that? We all battle the drift. We've all seen the latest round of news that's given the body of Christ a black eye. I'm telling you, I've gotten so frustrated over the years of watching as social media exploits its platform to tear down faith. Like, I'm tired of Christianity to be given a, a bad name. People are so drawn towards the negativity and the ones out there who are, uh, if I could just be frank, the people out there who should just shut their mouths. But we all make bad choices. We all do things. And we, got, we you know, sometimes we wonder, like, uh, should, I, should I jump in the, in the midst of it and, and, and join the, the barrage and attack those Christians and say they're not real Christians? Or should I step back and hope that it just goes away? Or, 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 or should I just absolve myself and say, I don't know those people. I'm not a part of the faith. Um, you know, th there's been so many different ways that this has happened. But one of the things that I'm frustrated with, though, is that as this tension grows and, and, and people make mistakes, things can get frustrating. It's frustrating that we can't fix it or undo it. It's frustrating because it makes me look bad as a Jesus lover. And there are people who have drifted from the truth. I mean, they look at this book and they read it. One of the things that Facebook has become famous for is extracting scriptures and putting them on there and taking them out of context. You know, like, like um, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. No, I am five foot four and I cannot dunk a basketball. Forget it. Just not going to happen. Okay? You know, like, like, like I, I, had a, <laughs> I, had a, I had a pastor one up. One time, a youth pastor, when I was a teenager, come up to me and, and he said, he said, hey son, do you want me to pray that God would make you grow? <laughs> there are some ways that God has designed us and made us that we should not mess with. You know, that's like a scripture taken out of context. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In the Bible there, Paul is talking about, he's, he's facing some like serious trauma. Like some stuff is going down. And he's being backed into a corner and there are people that are persecuting him. I mean like really persecuting him. And he's saying, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Okay? And the, 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 the text today is in 1 Timothy. 1, 18 through 20, and as we're talking about battling the drift, because we all battle it, like, you ever, you ever woke up one day, and you're like, how in heaven's name did I get here? 
Like, what happened? I mean, like, I was, I was a church-going person. I was loving Jesus. Things were going well for me. Things were happening. And then we took a couple missteps. Um, we made a couple poor choices. We uh, went to a wrong family or friend gathering, and we blew our life up. We started feeling for an individual that we shouldn't have felt for, like an emotional and personal way. And, 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 and something happened. And Paul here is speaking to Timothy as a, as a, as a spiritual mentor. He's, called him, he's calling him to step up. He's giving him a charge. He's like, look, my friend, step up. Hold on. Now, Paul can get kind of bold, so at the end of this uh, set of verses, Paul uh, just kind of sticks it to a couple of guys because they just keep messing up. But um, I, I just want to warn you of that because Paul, Paul at times, he was just like, I mean, he, just, he, he gut checked a few people a couple times. If you read the New Testament, if you read, you know, Saul who became Paul, you would recognize that Paul didn't pull punches. Um, but in 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20, it says, Timothy, my son... He called him a son. I mean, he was close to him. He says, I'm giving you this command in keeping with the prophecies once made about you, so that by recalling them, you may fight the battle while holding on to faith and a good conscience, which some have rejected. And here it is right here. And some have suffered shipwreck with regard to their faith. Some have suffered shipwreck in regard to their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander, whom I've handed over to Satan to be taught not to blaspheme. <laughs> I mean, he just like, <laughs> you know, I'm reading this and I'm like, I don't know if I should include that. But, but like Paul was just like, these two guys blew up their life. They made poor choice after poor choice and it shipwrecked their their life. We all battle drift. The church is planted on solid ground, a foundation of truth, but it takes a few missteps. And sometimes we can feel like our relationship with God is burdensome and boring. Sometimes it can get dull and difficult. Sometimes we can experience routine and we can feel like going to church is rutted, like, okay, got to get up Sunday, got to get myself together, got to try to get out of the house without beating one of these kids. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> You've never been there before? Like, for those of you guys who have had kids, like, like, some kids came to church, some kids were drugged to church. Like, sometimes my kids get drugged to church, Okay? It's okay. It happens sometimes. All right? I mean, I'm not telling you you should force faith on them, but, like, seriously, sometimes it's hard to... Okay. I just went, like, counseling there for a minute. I'm sorry. <laughs> Thanks for hearing me out. Um, but these people had taken a few missteps, and they shipwrecked their faith. And Paul's like, Timothy. Hey, Timothy, friend, son. Don't, don't do what they did. Don't follow in their footsteps. Don't allow this curve or this turn that you've seen them do cause you to lose sight of what's important, what is your calling. He tells them, he tells them to fight the battle well, holding the faith and a good conscience. And he uses strong words, he says, which some have rejected so they have suffered a, a shipwreck in regard to their faith. Hey, here's the truth. Point number two. We need each other. We need each other. We do. We need each other. We need each other to keep each other accountable, which... It's not always comfortable. Like I look at I look at some of the people in this room, and I you know like like um, 
just to, just to give you an illustration, like, like uh, Sally and Lorette, the dynamic duo. You know, that's what I call them sometimes. Um, these two girls, these two ladies, they, they call each other on the phone frequently. They hold each other up. How you doing, Sally? How you doing, Lorette? How you holding up? How's your faith? How's, how's where you are with God? How you doing? They help each other from avoiding that shipwreck. Here's what I don't want to tell you this morning. See, accountability isn't about policing someone's life. It's more like a cheerleader or a coach. And someone who helps you become the best version of yourself. A person who's like, come on, you got this. I mean, like someone who's like, like in your corner and they're like shouting out like, like, like Paul was with Timothy. I mean, like he's saying fight. He's saying fight. Don't allow this to shipwreck your life. How many of you guys honestly and sincerely got a person in your corner who is shouting you down saying, come on, you got this. Keep going, keep going. Don't lose faith. Don't lose sight. Don't, don't lose track of where you need to be or where you need to go. I'll tell you right now, like some people, some people are like, like, uh, well, who's yours, pastor? I'm telling you, I've got those people in my life. They're pastors that I gather with, pastors that I talk to, pastors that I connect with, pastors that I text. Just a couple of weeks ago, I was going through a hard time, and I shot a text to a pastor friend down in Portsmouth, and I'm like, look, man, things are not feeling well right now. I'm just drained, I'm exhausted, and I'm frustrated. And we texted it out because <laughs> we didn't have time to have a phone call. You know, he texted, I texted. He's like, you got this. And I'm like, no, I don't. And he's like, keep it up. You know, he's sending me verses. He's telling me encouraging things. He's, he's cheering me on. Hold on. Hold on. Hold on, Seth, so you don't shipwreck your life. Hold on, Seth, so you don't blow things up because we all battle the drift. You see, that's why I love my church. That's why we should love our church because like, like on Tuesday nights when we get together in what we call like a small group or a, a, a study group or whatever, those are our cheerleader kind of moments where we're like talking to each other about what's going on. And we're like, hey, how's it going? What's, how, how's it happening? And um, where's, your, where's your faith? You know, how you doing? We need each other. See, accountability in some ways has become this rigid, oh, you're screwing up. Get it right. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about this morning. I'm talking about cheering each other on. I'm talking about stepping in and saying, no, you can do this. You can do this. 1 Thessalonians 5.11 says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as, in fact, you are doing. In the church today, this is a hard statement. In the, in the church today, speaking of the church, not just ours, because it happens in ours too. In the church today, we have a lot of grace without growth. But when we choose accountability, we will begin to see grace with growth. That's like gracefully going to someone and saying, I see what you're doing. And I see where it's going to lead. I see what it's going to do. And I love you enough to tell you, stop. <laughs> I have it in my notes. I don't know if I should say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. You don't have to continue cycling in the same stupid. We get to grow up. We do. That's why I love my church. That's why I love my church. Now, I, I unfortunately got a, a call from Val. Sue and Val aren't doing too well. They're at home. They're, they're sick. And, and Ron and Barbara are away. Um, and... and uh, with family and friends, but uh, that man back there, Jim, who sits on my board, 
He's awesome. Like a cheerleader in the faith, that coach, that person who says, come on, pastor, you got this, you got this. He was praying for me this morning, asking God to just bless whatever it is that was put on my heart to share. Like, he's an awesome, awesome, you guys did well in voting him into that leadership position. Thank you. Jim is awesome. Yeah. He's the one who was instrumental in getting this, this nasty, dilapidated, falling apart trailer out of here. And man, you guys, there are so many things that happen behind the scenes that we don't even see. Like, I can't even, like, if I were to, like, go around the room, I could begin talking about how each one of you individually have cheered me on. Like, seriously. Like, you may not think, like, I haven't said very much to pastor, but, like, like you know, you, I, come, I, I come to church, and, and, and you come into service, and, and, we, and I get a hug, and you're like, hey, pastor, good morning. That's cheering me on. It's giving me hope. Because we all battle the drift, even this guy. Even this guy. And this isn't about believing deeper. This is, or this is about believing deeper. It's not about behaving better. Christian growth, in other words, does not happen first by just behaving better, but by believing better, believing bigger, believing deeper, believing brighter ways of Christ, that he's already secured sinners. And I personally, and you personally, need family and friends to remind you of this. I love you enough to tell you this, married couples, it can't always be your husband or your wife. All right? But do me a favor. If you're looking for someone to support and encourage you, guys, find a guy. Okay, girls, find a girl. That's all I'm going to say about that. You guys know that. But accountability can be tough, but if we love each other as a church, if we're here for each other as a church, I'm not talking about beating each other down. I'm talking about lifting each other up. The Bible tells us many, many, many times that words have power. Proverbs tell us even that the tongue has the power of life and death. You want to talk about the significant power of the tongue, just go to the book of James for a little bit. The book of James tells us that a whole forest is set on fire by the spark that a tongue can start. We're called to speak life into each other. And that, at times means uncomfortable conversations, but those uncomfortable conversations lead to you becoming a better person. The last I want to tell you, if you don't have a friend, find a friend. Find a friend. I know that there's some folks missing this morning. I know that. The, some of you have friends already in this building that, that you call, that you go to, that you, you reach out to. Some, some of you have friends that, that might not even be here in this building. Some of you have friends that are in other states or other cities, other counties or whatever. But we need to find a friend. We need to find a friend. I'm, I'm excited because, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit of a Disney Pixar fan, but Finding Dory's coming out pretty soon, and I'm going to take my kids to go see it. But um, if you've ever seen Finding Nemo, like, Marlon needed Dory, and Dory needed Marlon. For those of you guys who know what I'm talking about, some of you guys are like, I've never seen it. Go rent it or something. I, I, I mean, go to the, I, I don't know, it's probably not even at the red box. I don't know how you can go see it. I, I got a DVD. I can let you, I'll give it to you if you want to see it. But um, they like needed each other. Like every time Marlon was like, oh, I feel like giving up. I feel like quitting. I feel, you know, I, I lost my, Marlon lost his son in this movie. And Dory was just this airheaded, like, short-term memory loss person who just like, Every time Marlon needed some, like, support, like, come on, don't give up on your son, she was there to cheer him up. 
<laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, you can stop. <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about that, but I thought it would make it completely awkward, and it really did. I think there were two of you that started saying that, wasn't there? <laughs> yeah. I mean, seriously, I know, it's, it's kind of corny, but it's real. And, 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 then, and then there, comes, there came that point when, when, when Marlon started cheering on Dory when she couldn't remember something important to her. See, there was a bond there. There was something that happened there. There was a friendship that took place. And that, that, that bond, that friendship was strong. We need each other. We need each other. Because we all battle the drift. And you need to find a friend. You see, in Red Letter Christianity, Shane... Claiborne says this, people do not expect Christians to be perfect, they, but they do expect them to be honest. And here's, here's, the, here's, a, here's a powerful truth for you. I want you to think about this statement, okay? I want you to really ponder this. Confession and honesty cripples our sins and downfalls of their power over our life. If you are brave enough, if you are brave enough to say to your friend, I failed, I made a mistake, I did something stupid, I made a poor decision, it will break the back of the control that that poor choice has over your life. It just does. Some of us in this room, we are battling addictions on a daily basis. And I'm not just, like, like when we think addiction, we automatically move to alcohol, drugs, and those kinds of things. But some of us, we struggle with food. I mean, like, I could say Monday, I'm going to eat right, and then Wednesday, my wife made sticky buns. And I just... <laughs> Blow my diet up. It's over. No, I cut the cinnamon roll and stuck it on the plate. It's not her fault at all. In fact, I told her that it's her fault, and she's looked at me and said, no, it is not my fault. Did I put the knife on that tray, and did I take the fork and put that sticky bun on your plate four times? <laughs> <clears throat> <laughs> oh shoot. I am so busted. <clears throat> okay. See, did you did you just see what just happened there? The PK Stop being the, <laughs> the example or the illustration. She just switched in on me. This girl's smart. <laughs> I just became the illustration. <laughs> Woo. So three, three questions in closing. I want you guys to look at your bulletin. I've got that, that scripture in there, that First Timothy scripture in there, but three questions in closing. Do you have a church family member that will be there for you in all moments? Do you? Do you? I mean, like, seriously, do you? Do you have that person? Do you have that friend? And it can, it can be hard. I mean, let's be real. Um, some of us can be kind of awkward, and we're not very comfortable talking to people. Like, you know, like when, when pastor stands up and says, okay, go find some new people and hug them. And you're like, oh, great. I got to go to the bathroom. I'm out. And you go and hide for a few minutes, then come back in because it's just, it's challenging to meet new people. It's hard. I know. I know. I know. It's not easy, always easy being outgoing. It's not always easy to find that friend. But do you have a church family member that will be there for you in those moments? Not a policer who's, 
gonna, I don't even know if that's a word, not, a, not a, someone who's going to police you and going to get on your case when you uh, do something wrong, but someone who's going to hold you up and love you and sincerely tell you, if you don't stop, I see where this is headed. I see where this is headed. I see what you're doing, and I challenge you to fight harder, like Paul told Timothy. I challenge you to fight harder. Do you have someone? And who can you ask to be a friend today? What do you think about this? And last, how will you be there for your church family? Someone may ask you, you may get a phone call, and someone might be like, um, hey, I'm not doing well. I'm not doing well. I'm, I'm at work, and uh, there's this uh, individual, guy or girl, just keeps showing me attention that <coughs> nothing's happened, like physically, but there's an emotional bond that's starting to happen. I need your help. Can, can, can you encourage me? Can you pray for me? Can you help me out? Some of you guys are celebrating sobriety still. And there are times in your life where you just like, I had enough. I need a drink. And you need someone to call and say, hey, I'm going to make a poor choice. In fact, I've already gone to the outlet and I've got a bottle of whiskey sitting right in front of me. I need some help. I need some help. I mean, it, it could be anything. It could be anything. I think one of the most silent uh, things out there that people are the quietest about is probably pornography. Some of us, we need a friend who's going to say what needs to be said to pull us out of that. Some of us need to be that person who says what needs to be said to pull them out of that. Who's not going to knock them down or betray their confidence and trust. Who's going to go and say, who's going to go and say, hey, such and such, I really need you to pray for my friend. And then, like gossip. Okay? Because that's not an excuse to gossip. It's happened too many times. Someone who's talked to somebody and they have trusted somebody, and then that somebody has called somebody else, and they say, I don't want to, I don't want to make a, a stir or anything like that, but you know, and I don't want to, I don't want to make things like, uh, uh, I don't want you to look at this person bad, but you really need to pray for this person because, and then it just spills out. I love my church. I love my church because I really believe that these kind of friendships are blooming here. I really believe that. Someone who came to me uh, earlier this week and they said, Pastor, you know what we should do? We, we should start having some like uh, after church like lunches, like for ra just random reasons. Just like, it doesn't have to be like a special event like Easter or, or Thanksgiving or something like that. We, let's just start having some lunches so we can get together as a family after church. I think it's a great idea. I think it's a great idea. I think we should start doing that. Some of you guys, you leave this place and you go to lunch together. That's awesome. But I want to I wanna create some opportunity for us to have a greater family environment that we can be together, that we can be there for each other. How many times if someone would have just said something to us, would it have kept us from that poor choice? We all need those people in our lives. We all need those people. Perfections and love us anyway. God, I thank you for this morning. Thank you for truth. 
thank you for this uh, series that we're in right now, and I thank you for this opportunity to share. I thank you for the friends that gathered around me this week. I thank you for the friends that gather around me each week. And hold me up and encourage my faith to stay strong. And I pray, God, that the people in this room find a friend. They would find a friend so that they could keep the faith. 